Today we're going to start talking about vector functions. We'll start with a, a vector function, r of t, which is just a vector whose components are functions of t. Here we have f of t, g of t, and h of t for the three components of the vector function, r of t. We can treat vector functions in most ways just like regular functions. We're just going to get started a little bit today talking about how to apply the standard methods of calculus to vector functions. And that all begins with what we mean by a limit as say t approaches a of this vector function r of t. What we mean by that, by definition, will just be what we get when we take the limit as t approaches a in each component. So the first component is the limit as t approaches a of f of t, the second component the limit as t approaches a of g of t, and the third the limit as t approaches a of h of t. And then we just extend our standard definition of what it means for a function to be continuous to say that r of t is continuous at a if the limit as t approaches a of r of t is just exactly r of a. And of course, r of a is just the vector f of a, g of a, h of a, like that. Now, this is all preparing us to talk about differentiation for vector functions. Formally, this comes in the next section, but you can see right away how we should make that definition. We'll talk about the derivative of the vector function, r prime of t, as the limit, as, say, delta t approaches 0 of r of t plus delta t minus r of t over delta t. And then if we just separate that into components, what we get is a limit as delta t approaches 0 of then in each component, we'll have the same sort of limit expression. We'll have the limit as delta t approaches 0 of f of delta t. I'm sorry, t plus delta t. Minus f of t over delta t. The second component will be the limit as delta t approaches 0 of g of t plus delta t minus g of t over delta t. And the third component will just be the limit as delta t approaches 0 of h of t plus delta t minus h of t over delta t. And then when you evaluate each of these limits, This will just be the vector with the limits on the inside here. Then when you evaluate each of the limits, you'll get exactly uh, f prime of t, g prime of t, and h prime of t. So the end result is we can differentiate a vector function just by differentiating each component. As I mentioned, we'll be doing more about this in the next section. What I'd like to do now is just show you some examples of some vector functions whose graphs provide interesting curves in three-dimensional space. <clears throat> so what do we mean by that? We can just look at this vector function, r of t, given by f of t, g of t, h of t, where the parameter t runs from a to b. And we can think of that as being a curve which begins at the vector r of a. What do I mean by at the vector r of a? Well, we're always going to think of these vectors as having their tails at the origin, and we'll just think of the point, which is the head of that vector. So, for example, when we have r of t is cosine 5t, sine 5t, and 2t, when t equals 0, we'll have r of 0 equals 1, 0, 0. And that's exactly this vector, like that. This is the x-axis coming down here to the left. This is actually the y-axis going uh, in the direction towards the right. And the z-axis is our vertical axis. So the vector 1, 0, 0 is this vector. And when we say the curve starts at that vector, we mean at the point at the head of that vector right there.
Then if we look at different values of t as t increases, I've shown the picture here. Uh, this shows the picture where t goes from 0, I believe, until 5. That's just the, the way I've drawn this. When t equals 0, we start here. As we increase t, when it goes all the way around to t equals pi, we get to here. I'm sorry, 2 pi. Uh, oh, no. Uh, here we have cosine 5t and sine 5t. So here, this will correspond to the value when t is equal to 2 pi over 5. Here I'll have t equals 4 pi over 5 and 6 pi over 5. And then we'll get back. That's close to um, t equals 5 when t equals 8 pi over 5 up here, which is very close to, but not exactly equal to 5 up there. So what happens as we increase t? Well, if you ignore the z component, the third coordinate of the vector, we just have cosine 5t and sine 5t. So if we just drop everything into the xy plane, you can think of a parametric curve where the x-coordinate is cosine 5t, the y-coordinate is sine 5t. It would just go around and around in a circle. But what's happening to the z-coordinate this whole time? It's increasing, so we go up in a shape called the helix, spiraling around the z-axis, rising upwards the entire time. Here's a much simpler example. We have r of t, the, our vector function r of t is the vector 1 minus t, 2t, and 1 minus 3t, and I've drawn the picture here when t goes from 0 to 1. So that r of 0 is just the vector 1, 0, 1. That's right here x equals 1, y equals 0, z equals 1. So again, that we're thinking of the vector function. So you have a vector from the origin to that point, but we're thinking about a curve that represents just the points that are shown by the head of the vectors. There's r of 0. r of 1, the end of the curve, will be at the vector 0, 2, and negative 2, which is over here. So this vector function represents motion along this three-dimensional curve, which is just a straight line segment. And it shouldn't be a surprise that it's a straight line segment, since this is equivalent to writing from here, x equals 1 minus t. From here, we have y equals 2t. And from here, we have z equals 1 minus 3t. And these are exactly parametric equations for a line, as we saw at the end of the last chapter. Here's just another example I use my computer to uh, draw a picture of. We have the vector function r of t equals e to the t, t squared, and 1 minus t. Again, I've plotted it for t equals 0 to 1. You'll notice very easily that r of 0, the initial vector or initial point on the curve, r of 0 is the vector 1, 0, 1, which is way up here. It kind of looks like it's at the z-axis, but the way things are actually scaled, that corresponds to x equals 1. So I, it's a bit awkward the way the computer drew the axes there. Uh, the actual origin would be over here. So I'll try to fix this picture. A little bit like that and so this is one unit away from the z-axis in the x direction and then as t increases to 1 we have r of 1 is the vector e 1 0 which is way over here and you can see this vector function represents motion along this curve from this initial point here to this end point. Let me uh, fix the drawing here. <clears throat> Our final example here has a much more complicated shape. We're looking at r of t equals square root of 1 minus t squared, 4 minus t squared, and sine of 5t. t goes from minus 1 to 1. Now here you can see with the axes in the standard position, the x-axis here, the y-axis there, and the z-axis there, the curve looks very strange. When t equals minus 1, we started x equals 0, y equals 0, 
and z is sine of minus 5. Well, minus 5, sine of minus 5 is a positive number. So we start up here, and you see we move along the curve down this way, back up and around. But it's really hard to tell what that curve looks like here to see the whole shape. So I kind of rotated the entire system of axes. We still have the x-axis down here and the y-axis up here. Ignore these things there. And when you see that, you see that the shape actually has, if we follow from t equals minus 1 to t equals 1, we're going to start at the x-coordinate equals 0. The x-coordinate will go out to 1 and back to 0. So following the curve along this way. The y-coordinate will start at 0, go out to y equals 4 and back. And the z-coordinate starts up at sine of negative 5, which is positive, and it decreases. Um, in fact, in this somewhat more complicated way that you can see a little bit better up here in this uh, upper picture, until you get to sine of 5, which is a negative number.